All right, today I'd like to introduce our speaker, um, Professor Amy Rosemond from the University of uh, Georgia. Amy is uh, an aquatic ecologist uh, and a distinguished professor at the university. Uh, she has um, got her PhD from Vanderbilt uh, University uh, and is, um, as I said, it's in the, uh, she's a professor in the Odom School of Ecology at the University of Georgia used to be the assistant director of the Institute of Ecology there. She is the, currently the past president, that is she was president last year, of the uh, Society for Freshwater Sciences. Uh, most of our research is, uh, deals with freshwater ecology, um, in particular quite a bit on ecosystem ecology. Uh, she has about 100 publications in journals such as Bioscience, uh, Ecology, and Ecologia. And as the um, screen shows, she's gonna to talk today about surprises and insights from long-term stream ecological experiments. Amy. Thanks, Jim. And uh, those who uh, made it out to celebrate Earth Day. So I really appreciate the invitation to come as the Armitage lecturer as I uh, said yesterday, what an honor uh, just knowing about Ken Armitage's life and the fact that it was his family who's funded this seminar series. So I very much appreciate the invitation and the great time that Jim has shown me and what a beautiful town you have here in Lawrence. Uh, and a great opportunity for me um, to I also want to acknowledge my collaborators and my students that give me something to talk about when I talk about research. Um, but it, when Jim asked me to speak and said, okay, you'll be giving two different seminars, um, this was kind of my favorite because it made me think about what were the surprises that we got from doing these long-term experiments. And let's see, I'll try to get my, there we go. Um, and I think most of us are working in the field of ecology and in working in that field, I think we have a lot in common with this Apollo astronaut, Alfred Warden, when uh, he said, now, that I, now I know why I'm here, not for a closer look at the moon, but to look back at our home, the earth. And I think, as we study ecological systems, we're really doing nothing more than getting a closer look at our home and what supports us. So I have a series of images, people like us exploring natural systems, putting a net in the water. Sorry, not much vegetation analysis by student Carolyn. Um, anytime we do things, run an experiment, get out and sample in the field, this person's snorkeling. These beautiful images are by Jeremy Monroe and Freshwaters Illustrated uh, that's given us a lot of visual imagery from streams. Out on Lake Herrick at the UGA campus, in the Grand Canyon. So whenever we endeavor and look at things, Sometimes we get surprises. Nate's gonna splash the student, but that might be a surprise. And so we have to ask ourselves, this concept of surprise, why is this important for us to think about as ecologists? And in our work, we would say, well, it's, it's that we, can refine predictions of ecological outcomes. But I would say we should think about it on a larger scale and think about how surprise is really at the nexus of the scientific social pact of scientists being able to predict um, what happens with our resource use and the future of the planet. It's sort of the what will happen if question that scientists are called to be working on as part of understanding the planet especially want to think about this two-way street because we could say surprise is where predictions 
don't meet expectations. And um, so is that, does that mean that the expectations need to be expanded to include future scenarios of climate change and other sources of variation? Uh, there was a great paper I found that was published in 2017 by Philby, Dexter, and colleagues, where they define ecological surprise, defined as a situation where human expectations or predictions of natural system behavior deviate from observed ecosystem behavior. And they describe uh, kind of three ways that conditions that lead to surprise. Uh, and so I just want to outline those. It's where, you know, here the orange line is what we um, expect or predict, and the blue line is what's actually observed. So in this first scenario, it's that the system changed, but we didn't anticipate that. And it indicates something that we didn't know was going to happen. In the second example, it's where um, the, we thought the system would change to orange with this increase, but it didn't change. We failed to influence the system behavior in some way. And the third way is that something was discovered that ran current to what we thought the way the world worked, but it actually got us closer to our observation. And so this is this orange line coming closer to the blue line. I didn't want to give any surprises today. <laughs> so here's the structure of my talk. I'm first going to give uh, sort of what I consider a classic example of ecological surprise. It was actually a long-term nutrient enrichment to a tundra stream and what was found there in uh, the Brooks Range. Then describe things that were observed by my colleagues and I with our long-term nutrient enrichments in these detrital-based systems. And what we learn from those surprises. Then to circle back and talk about this, the sociology, the socio-ecological piece of surprise and what that calls us to do and ways to think about, especially thinking about Earth Day. Uh, surprises are typically not considered good. So how can we um, bring to align better our predictions and societal expectations? So ecological surprise 101, I would say, was this long-term fertilization experiment of a tundra stream, the Kuparic River. And this paper came out in 2004, Catherine Slavic and colleagues. And these investigators dripped phosphorus into this tundra stream from the you know, early to mid 80s into the um, late 1990s. And what you'll see, so here's chlorophyll A on this y-axis, percent cover of moss on this axis. Here's the pea fertilized reach of the stream and the reference. So they were fertilizing, fertilizing, and getting a lot of this algal biomass, slimy stuff on rocks, for about nine years. And then this moss appeared. So this percent cover ranges from about 30% to 80%. So it took nine years for this moss to show up. And at the same time, the algal response is diminished. And that's because when you're covering all the rocks with that moss, the algae can't really um, do its thing. So surprising in that we usually think when we change a system, the parts will stay the same. And in this case, they were getting this whole new part. So it helped us expand our thoughts about how enrichment affects ecosystems, thinking about multiple parts, like things like moss can show up, algae is important, and of course, my, my favorite, the dead organic matter. So I want to describe, build on what I um, talked about yesterday and talk about where we actually got surprises in these long-term nutrient enrichment experiments at Coweta. 
And just to give you a, a brief thumbnail, here we are between the Georgia and North Carolina border, the Coweta Basin, uh, experiments one again, and experiments two. And I'm mostly gonna talk about our whole stream studies. These were the locations um, at Coweta and um, also some things that we did in streamside channels and the um, microcosms. So experiment one, I'll, I'll have a test so that now that we've talked about this for two days, <laughs> some of that, that was um, two paired streams, two years of pretreatment data collected, and then five years of continuous nutrient enrichment. Experiment two was five streams, one year of pretreatment. That served as our reference. It's like, we got away with that experimental design and two years of continuous enrichment, but at different ratios of nitrogen to phosphorus. So this gave us the opportunity to really say, this was a red field ratio, N to P 16 to one, but let's go and give things wildly different ratios of nitrogen to phosphorus, two to one to 128 to one, and really test whether the things that we're seeing are N-driven or P-driven. Uh, this is uh, John Kamenowski, who's now um, Associate Professor at Florida International University, and David Manning was a doctoral student, and now he's an Assistant Professor at University of Nebraska, Omaha. So working on prairie streams now. We managed to do this flow proportional dosing of these long stream reaches. So 150 meters to about 80 meters, depending on which experiments. And we actually, so we had these concentrated nutrient solutions in carboys programmed to fire with a pump based on discharge. So we could keep the same nutrients concentration in um, continuously. So our surprise in experiment number one is that with long-term nutrient enrichment, we saw prey become decoupled from macroinvertebrate predators. I showed you yesterday that these, the, pop, the production of primary consumers really aligns with the production of macroinvertebrate predators, things like big stoneflies and dragonfly larvae. But with enrichment, uh, we were getting a lot of primary consumers that weren't eaten and that energy didn't transfer to macroinvertebrate predators. So this came from this first experiment where we had uh, the paired streams, pretreatment, five years of continuous enrichment and moderate concentrations of nitrogen and phosphorus. And to show you what these food webs look like, we're here at the bottom with the coarse benthic organic matter, fine benthic organic matter. We've got some algae, little bits, uh, feeding scrapers, shredders, collectors, and then predatory macroinvertebrates are up a trophic level. And then we have salamander predators. And I get to talk about the salamanders today too. Uh, but for right now, I want you to think about the energy transfer from these primary consumers to these predatory macroinvertebrates. This shows primary consumers, things like mayflies, uh, shredding caddisflies, dipterin larvae, biomass, which is based on monthly averages per stream, and annual production. These are the two years of pretreatment data. And then this is when we started to add our nutrients. Uh, we lost year three of our uh, samples. Bummer. We didn't have, we were kind of in between grants and the sob story. Um, but you'll see that uh, with nutrient enrichment, these primary consumers really increased in their biomass and annual production. Uh, in subsequent years of enrichment in the treatment stream, these solid bars. We did not see 
uh, a similar trend with our macroinvertebrate predators. And so this shows these same data, except for the predatory macroinvertebrates. This is work that John Davis did as part of his dissertation work. Biomass here and why it crossed before him. Um, here, years one, two, three, four of enrichment. And you see, okay, after two years, some increase in biomass and production of the predatory macroinvertebrates, but that was not sustained in subsequent years of enrichment. Well, what's great about long-term research is that you have patterns that tell you how the world's supposed to work and helps you make predictions. And this figure shows the relationship between primary consumer production, how much mayflies we're getting, versus predator production in uh, streams all around Coweta. So these open symbols are previously published data by my colleague, Bruce Wallace and others, showing that these things line up pretty darn well. Uh, these gray dots are the um, enriched stream, um, no, sorry, enriched years, but in the reference stream. So that's a reference condition. And then um, P1 and P2 are in the pretreatment years in our enriched stream. E1 is our first year of enrichment. So we enriched the stream and we got more primary consumers and we got more predators. But in years two through five, that relationship changed. And so this shows enrichment year two in our treatment stream, enrichment year four, enrichment year five. And so here we're getting lots more primary consumers, but that isn't matched in terms of uh, predatory macroinvertebrates. And in fact, if we, uh, enrichment year five followed our predictions, we'd be up here above the title. We would have something like 12,000 milligrams of ash free dry mass per meter squared per year of dragonfly larvae, but instead we have something like uh, 3,000. So a decoupling, here we had this super predictive relationship, but um, that changed with nutrient enrichment. So why did that occur? It was that one taxa got in there and um, became like the best exploiter in the bunch. Pycnocyche gentilis, as we all know, it's, it's all about life history when we are trying to understand the uh, environment and environmental change. This shows Pycnocyche in these red bars in the treatment stream relative to the reference. And it actually increased 12 times, we saw 12 times the production of pycnocyche in our treatment stream with nutrient enrichment in our fifth year. This is a caddis fly, it's, its eggs are laid in the uh, late fall. So it's hatching out right when these uh, streams get their big dose of carbon from the forest. And then it grows in the early winter months and so it got in there to go crazy and in later stages, so it's um, the case that it makes is made of leaves initially, but then it starts putting it on rocks. And so it also became resistant to predation. That was its um, superpowers, I guess. We called it a leaf hog. <laughs> so it was pretty dramatic to go out in the stream uh, a little bit hard to see, but you could pick up a handful of leaves and all of these are pycnocyte in their stone cases that you would pick up out of the stream. I took the time to circle them the other day and I wasn't really even staging that. I tried to be um, conscientious about just like, let me just see what I get. Uh, so pretty dramatic. We're changing all this leaf carbon into these Pycnocyche cast flies, and it's not going up the next trophic level. So what we learned from this surprise was that those aspects of life history 
and timing of resource use were super important. Uh, Pycnopsyche was first at the table. It then had uh, the ability to resist being eaten. And when we look at the three categories of surprise that we learned from Philby Dexter and colleagues, this was, we failed to anticipate. We just didn't really think about um, the subtleties of these life history patterns that we could see some taxa that could exploit these conditions much better than others. Helps us expand our views of what we would expect with nutrient enrichment. So it basically created this trophic dead end uh, that wasn't predicted. Uh, but I would say, you know, sort of why didn't we see this coming? Uh, I would say that we see with nutrient enrichment, we see these trophic dead ends occur in all kinds of places whenever we get an algal bloom. So in this case, the algae have grown, uh, but they aren't eaten by the zooplankton that are going to control that biomass. And either it's runaway production that the grazers can't keep up with, but in many cases it's mechanical or toxic um, compounds that make them resistant to grazing. So it was another thing we learned is, wow, you can get, when you add nutrients and change the environment, uh, like Brian and I were talking about this morning, uh, you know, you're changing the playing field. And if someone can take advantage of those conditions and they can be resistant to predators, those linked traits really um, get you down this path of then creating conditions where that energy isn't transferred. So Jim's gonna love this one because it's all about how important the algae are. And the salamanders in this system uh, really, you know, here we are, we're like, knee deep in detritus, but the salamander said, hey, there's a little bit of algae there and um, that looks good to me. So we saw a response in, in the salamanders that we hadn't predicted. Our two main players are Desmond Nathan, <laughs> I could have said it earlier with more coffee, um, DQ, Quadrimaculatus, a uh, big salamander, and twice the size of Eurycia wilderi. Uh, the DQ lives about four years in the stream in its larval stage before it's crawling out in the forest. And it's about twice the size of Eurycia. So we saw um, effects on both of these taxa. When we get to the, the diets, the salamanders are not as gape limited as the Eurycia. And we, we were able to see sort of bigger diet responses there. But again, they're mostly eating these primary consumers. These results are from experiment number two, where we've really tied to, tried to pull with these gradients. Is it more nitrogen or is it more phosphorus with ratios of two to one to 128 to one in these different streams? These our moderate concentrations relative to what we see on the landscape. Phosphorus was uh, about 11 to 90 micrograms per liter. Nitrogen was about 80 to 650 micrograms per liter. Again, we loaded this stuff up in carboys and it was continuously pumped in the streams for two years. Here's Philip Bumpers who did this work uh, looking at growth of these salamanders in these reptaria over periods of months and also did uh, mark recapture experiments. So I'm going to show you mostly what happened with DQ, uh, where we, uh, they were more amenable to growth in these reptaria. Uh, Philip measured growth on about 200 salamanders in these three month incubations in the fall and the spring. He also did mark uh, capture, mark recapture with both of these species and um, saw positive effects of phosphorus 
these gradients, of course, are fighting with each other. So it's, if you respond to P, you're doing that at relatively low end. But what we saw in terms of growth is no response to our added N gradient and an increase of about 35% increased growth in salamanders with the phosphorus gradient. So how are they doing this? Uh, Philip looked at over um, almost 700 salamander guts to look at what their prey was uh, pre-enrichment and years one and two of enrichment. So here are these plots. Here's the diet of DQ described in this pre-circle and the diet in year one and the diet in year two, which I've circled in red. Uh, Eurycia, a weaker response. And so we'll focus on DQ. But what we see is that it, there was a significant shift in diet and it's shifting more to algivorous, uh, the scrapers, macroinvertebrates, and away from detritivores. In both species, there was an increase in just prey biomass in the salamander guts. They were going out there and they were filling their guts up with more prey with nutrient enrichment. But the prey that they, that really increased were these algivores, the scrapers. And this shows prey biomass in those guts, pretreatment conditions, year one and year two of enrichment. And um, you can see that these algivores were increasing and the detritivores, uh, if anything, were decreasing. So they um, were really changing the composition. You can see also uh, comparing pre-algivores and detritivores, pre-treatment conditions, they were feeding on more detritivores, but under these enriched conditions, more algivores than to try divorce. Well, super perplexing um, to us going out and sampling the benthic macroinvertebrates because there's very few shredders that we could find. The salamanders were doing a much better job of that. So when um, this is Mick Demi's work, he was a graduate student with John Benstead at the University of Alabama. And he measured the uh, monthly biomass of all these bugs in these five streams, pre-treatment, year one and year two. And the only two functional feeding groups that we saw increases in were the scrapers and the shredders. Uh, you can see the biomass here of scrapers is very low. It's less than 5% of total biomass collector filters, collector gatherers, predators, scrapers, and shredders. And then Mick uh, determined the trophic basis of production, which is super data intensive work where you're analyzing the diets of all the macroinvertebrates. And after you've already determined the annual production of these things. So here is the pre year one, year two in our five different streams. In green is how much diatom energy is supporting these macroinvertebrates. And we're seeing not much based on um, the trophic basis of production. But when we look at what changed relative to pre-treatment, it was the, so this is changes in the trophic basis of these bugs when we enrich the stream. What did they depend on for energy resources pre-treatment versus when they had nutrients? And you, um, you know, all of these pathways increased because we were getting a lot more production. But relative to pre-treatment, it was that the diatoms increased the most along with wood, which was another, became a more important food resource because it's now becoming more nutrient rich. Uh, animal, interestingly, animal energy flow to other animals declined with enrichment. 
along the lines of what we're seeing in terms of if these primary con consumers can get predator resistant, they're not going to be feeding um, predatory macroinvertebrates. So this is no surprise to Jim, but because um, algae do run the world in many places. Uh, so that, but this was kind of a, a change in behavior that we saw induced by nutrient enrichment that changed prey selectivity. And these predators were capitalizing on phosphorus. We've seen in other studies, uh, initial stoichiometric analyses that we did in these streams that scrapers actually are higher phosphorus content than shredders. That aligns with the crummy food that shredders are actually typically consuming and what scrapers get to consume. And so consuming the scrapers may have been the pathway for salamanders to reduce phosphorus limitation. Uh, and so we saw that you know, even extremely shaded streams lean to green when they're enriched with nutrients. I think the most profound surprise that we've received is looking at nitrogen versus phosphorus limitation in these systems. And with all of the um, policies that currently exist, the question is, are things N limited or are they P limited? Our results mean that we have to totally ask that question a different way because we not only saw co-limitation, which we can also talk about, but we saw what I would call multiple limitation. Different parts of the system were limited by different nutrients. And um, so I wanna walk you through from the bottom to the top of the food web with the evidence that we have uh, where the bottom of the food web, fungal production seems to be more nitrogen versus phosphorus limited. Leaf breakdown uh, appears to be co-limited by nitrogen and phosphorus, but by slightly different pathways because these fungi can sequester phosphorus. And our bugs responded to phosphorus concentrations in the leaf litter, which I'll show you with Lee um, McDemi's work, and that what I've shown you is that our salamanders were phosphorus limited. So you're all aware of crackers and peanut butter. And uh, just to walk through with stream water phosphorus, it's mostly fungi that are growing on coarse fractions of organic matter. Bacteria uh, are the main microbial colonizers of small particle carbon. But fungi, it's all about its wood, its leaves, and stream. So they grow, but they also sequester nutrients in their tissue. And so this whole leaf complex becomes lower in carbon to phosphorus, lower in carbon to nitrogen. In Vlaas' experiments, he um, did, uh, and this is my little fungal spore, which Keller Supercrop was one of the pioneers in stream microbial ecology. And he would say, it's like these spores do cartwheels in the stream and they land on a leaf and then they grow. So I've always liked this, this particular spore. They come in all kinds of cool shapes. Uh, in Vlad's uh, sterile microcosms at Coastal Carolina University, he can manipulate these single species fungi that he's cultured from streams at Coweta and then multiple species assemblages, measures fungal production. And so along this gradient of dissolved nitrate, he sees increased fungal production due to nitrate, but not due to SRP. When he measured the fungal tissue carbon to nitrogen ratio, 
uh, with media that had dissolved C to N ratios that varied across this gradient, that fungal tissue didn't change very much. We would say that's homeostatic. Uh, but with given phosphorus in the media, there was more of a change in fungal biomass C to P. So that it appears that the fungi can sequester P when it's available, but what they really like to grow and their production is driven more by nitrogen. David Manning uh, was conducting all the experiments on leaf litter breakdown. And the question was, is, it, is nitrogen or phosphorus more important? And the answer was basically both. Uh, but remember, we had this crazy design where we were adding nitrogen, we were adding phosphorus, we had shredder biomass, we had fungal biomass, we had litter stoichiometry, and so and, and we knew, you know, discharge and temperature. And so what David did was structural equation modeling to say, well, what are what are the pathways that are most important in determining what the breakdown is? And what are the pathways that come from nitrogen and what are the pa pathways that come from phosphorus? And so this is based on over a thousand litter bag studies in these streams. Uh, with both of these models, we can predict about 57% of variation in those litter breakdown rates. And there's but subtle differences between the pathway of, with DIN is linked a lot to fungal biomass linked to breakdown and shredder biomass, all contributing to this process. In terms of phosphorus, there is an important link between phosphorus and the litter carbon to phosphorus ratio. And so that wasn't appearing with DIN and is um, supports and is consistent with Vlad Gullis's lab experiments that show when phosphorus is available, the fungi can really sequester this and our leaves become lower in carbon to phosphorus. That then goes on to um, affect shredder breakdown and breakdown overall. And then here is McDemy's results where he has various uh, response or um, explanatory variables and found that the leaf litter percent P was really the biggest thing driving the primary consumer production in uh, under enriched conditions. So um, I forgot the legend here, but the open symbols are our pre-year, gray is year one, uh, black is year two of enrichment. So as leaf litter percent P increases, so did primary consumer production there was not a similar relationship with N or litter C to N. And then I had shown you that salamanders apparently were responding to P and not N. So I think this is a uh, really important result from a management perspective that we're not used to thinking, asking that question. We all know that ecosystems are made of multiple parts, but when we talk about nutrient limitation, we typically want to say, well, what's the indicator? I just want to measure chlorophyll A or leaf breakdown or some process, but actually organisms are responding to different nutrients in different ways. So I would say that current frameworks, you know, it was kind of surprising to be sitting there and it's like, oh, it's not either or, it's both and in multiple places. Uh, and so I, I really hope that my group and others can help push this concept into policy uh, in terms of um, nutrient enrichment of freshwater ecosystems, because we're seeing this evidence of multiple nutrient limitation. If you have suggestions for other ways to phrase that that would resonate with people, I'd love to hear your ideas. Uh, and I'd say, you know, this is probably falls under discover something that runs to accepted knowledge, we didn't really even know to ask that question.
So I want to return uh, to this concept of surprise and to think about what that means in terms of how we conduct experiments, but also how we engage with the public and think about how we're conveying our ecological information to the public. Uh, you know, on the ecological side, this is from the Philby Dexter paper. So really nice um, image that shows, you know, scientists here, resource users here. I always like to remind myself, hey, I'm a resource user too. And so we need to also use our, um, our perspectives as we are, we are the public too. Um, but, you know, it's all about the expectations of these observers, why we get surprised in the first place. So when we think about the social system, what awareness does the social system have? What, how's this social system, ecological system being managed? What are the expectations from these ecosystems and predictions that are being made? And I would say um, we really need to think about this question because freshwater ecosystems are in decline. There is now, I think, a, um, a little bit of a call to arms. We recognize where our policies are failing. It really started with that barren paper that I talked about yesterday, functioning freshwater ecosystems and what they need. Uh, even then, the Barron paper was calling for policies that were more comprehensive. We can't just use the Endangered Species Act and a couple other tools we have. This report just came out in March um, by a group called the Environmental Integrity Project, and it's calling out the fact that the Clean Water Act is failing us, that um, it's, you know, 50 years later, let's take a look at it. 51% of rivers and streams that have been assessed are classified uh, as impaired by pollution. I spoke yesterday briefly about these uh, US EPA aquatic resource assessments, rivers and streams, coasts, wetlands, and lakes, and that they're being conducted every five years. When I say they're considered poor, here's macroinvertebrates and here are fish. And so uh, poor was assessed using bioassessment in these streams and 44% uh, were considered impaired. This was the difference between the latest data that just came out in December, 2020 and the previous um, study. And so um, that's, difference relative to how good or bad things were five years ago. In terms of fish, poor, 37% considered poor based on fish, um, you know, presence, absence, biotic index scores. The nutrients are a real problem. And so there are physical chemical variables that are also collected as part of these uh, rivers and streams assessment. And just based on concentrations and where we know there's harm to systems, 58% uh, of US streams, based on this um, sampling of 2000 streams, 58% considered poor uh, based on their phosphorus concentrations, 43% considered poor based on their nitrogen concentrations. And so we have to ask ourselves, how good are we prediction at predictions? How good are we at expectations? So we're seeing algal blooms become more frequent. Um, this is a recipe that any of us could write on a piece of paper. It's nitrogen plus phosphorus plus temperature equals harmful algal blooms. And um, this is a, um, Hans Pearl has been a real leader in this area describing um, how algal blooms occur. And the fact that um, this inset figure is showing different um, algae, chlorophytes, the greens, diatoms, 
cyanobacteria, which are the ones that are producing toxins. Here is temperature on the x-axis. So the growth optima of cyanobacteria, they like it hot. And so this is part of our prediction of what we would expect in reservoirs, lakes, and coasts that are getting a lot of nutrients. And as they warm, the competitive advantage will be with cyanobacteria. This is taken in my backyard in Athens, and it's a sorry state for a lot of uh, small streams and rivers. This is just the little um, branches of bigger streams that we need to be taken care of. Uh, but this isn't actually my, I, I wouldn't let this happen if it was my backyard, but um, this is in Athens. I think there's an apartment complex here, uh, but it just shows you how uh, watershed land use and um, not caring, managing these small streams leads to what looks like something that doesn't feel too well. How surprising is this? We should ask ourselves. So if we come back to our so the sociological uh, interactions between that give us surprise, predictions not meeting expectations. Uh, again, we have to think of ourselves as resource users. The, um, one of the key concepts I've learned from my colleagues is co-produce knowledge. We um, need to be effective in engaging with different groups of the public and finding out what is, you know, what people want from rivers and streams uh, and do this in a way where people can um, contribute to what those goals are. And in terms of, um, you know, what the public, just fostering greater awareness, be more protective and proactive in our management and um, developing realistic expectations so that we know a plus B is going to equal C. Is that what people want? But, and I think one of the things that um, we, that's been profound for me to think about is it is all about values. And it, it also is making things apparent to people. Um, and so I would say that um, these expectations where we're facing uncertainty due to climate change uh, need to be realistic. And what that calls us to do is to uh, embrace humility as part of our approach to our uh, natural resources. So this, the definition of humility is freedom from pride or arrogance the quality or state of being humble. This uh, paper that my colleagues wrote, Don Nelson's an anthropologist, Brian Bledsoe is a um, engineer, Marshall Shepard is a meteorologist. You may have seen him on the Weather Channel. Mar Marshall Shepard is a um, super effective communicator. And um, the paper that they wrote is from hubris to humility transcending original sin and managing hydroclimatic risk. And so it's especially important for us as we face uh, uncertain future in terms of climate change to particularly adopt uh, a position of humility. They developed this concept from their three lenses to say, okay, what we need for humility-based management is the anthropologist says to, for humans to see themselves as part of nature. It's not something that's out there and um, it's all one thing. The engineer says, engineer with this dynamic nature. And Brian Bledsoe is leading a lot of work that we're doing at the University of Georgia on natural infrastructure. Working with the Army Corps of Engineers to integrate um, green infrastructure, even conserving land pushing back river levees to have green infrastructure work with gray. And 
uh, our models are complex and they are uncertain. So just acknowledging that complexity uh, and making, um, maybe knowing what we don't know uh, and um, at least trying to guess. So on Earth Day, um, I'll leave you with that image uh, for us to get closer to our home and to approach it with more humility.